This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Bill Van Skoyek, who is not a veteran of the United States military, but he's here to tell us about a very special one named Rick Rescorla. He's also here to tell us about his role in the harrowing events of 9-11 inside the World Trade Center. And Rick, thanks very much for being with us. Hey, Greg, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And honestly, um, I, I'm, I'm just so appreciative of the fact that, that we get to speak of, of Rick and, and his heroism and what he did uh, on 9-11. Where were you born and raised? So I was born and raised in Yonkers, New York, Westchester County, and Yonkers is about 20 minutes outside of Manhattan. And uh, as you can probably tell by my accent, I am a, an absolute um, New Yorker through and through, even though I live in Florida now for the last nine years, which is basically just Southern New York. So. <laughs> but, uh, but it's great. I'm very proud of my heritage, where I come from. And uh, nothing to me was uh, more spectacular than uh, working in New York City, okay, for the years that I did, and uh, in particular working in the Trade Center, uh, which to me was the penny ultimate of my career uh, from an ex experience standpoint, just a wonderful place to be, okay, and um, very proud of the firm that I work for and, uh, and the presence that we had in that building. How many employees did Morgan Stanley have at the Trade Center? Well, I mean, my memory was Morgan Stanley was the single largest tenant in that location. Uh, with a presence in, in multiple buildings in the Trade Center. And I believe we had somewhere in the vicinity of about 3,300 to 3,400 employees um, in, in total um, in, in the buildings there. Wow. How did you meet Rick Rescorla? Well, I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, Rick's personality okay, and Rick's presence were always known, even for somebody new coming to, to the location. I remember just the initial fire drills and, and, and some of the preparatory events that they would have in the Trade Center. You know, the Trade Center was a great location and, and it was one of the most amazing places I've ever sat foot in, in in my life. And it was just unbelievable. And we would have safety and fire drills on a regular basis and Rick would coordinate and run those drills. And I didn't know who Rick was, honestly, when, when I first uh, knew him but his presence and his demeanor certainly defined him uh, when I first met him. And I could just tell, I could sense his passion for making sure that everyone was secure and that he was protecting everyone in that building. You mentioned his demeanor. What was it like on a regular day? He was great. I mean, you know, Rick was uh, definitely, and again, I didn't find out until, until after the fact, but you know, Rick was a soldier. I mean, he was he was somebody that was inspiring, somebody that you would see that that you would want to look up to, and somebody who was a true leader and, and someone that that um, you had confidence in, that that would do the right thing at the right time. So only after the fact did I even find out um, of his valor and his courage in Vietnam and what he did. And um, funny for a guy just coming there working in a building, I never had more confidence and felt more secure okay, working with someone than I did with Rick. I just thought he was fantastic. Wow. How did he, he talked a little bit about how he approached his job, how he, it was his mission to protect everyone. How did that manifest itself and how he interacted with you and everybody else there? Well, what I think was great about Rick is, you know, there was an open line of communication for where we worked. I mean, obviously we were in a, an incredibly high profile building and folks would always talk about Okay, the bombing incident that happened back in the early 90s. And that story was so prevalent and, and told so many different times that it almost became self-educational okay, for, for um, what you needed to do to, to hopefully or hopefully not ever encounter okay, a similar situation such as that. But I think Rick did an unbelievable job of instilling in people the fact that you need to be quick, you need to be decisive, you need to listen and you need to leave that building. And that's exactly what he instilled because all I can think about is my own part in, in what happened. And the decision was almost instantaneous. It was from all of the training. I remember people said it took two hours to get down the stairwell okay, during the bombing. And I remember saying, man, I, I don't wanna be in this location for two hours if something okay, really bad is gonna happen. And I certainly don't wanna have anybody that I'm responsible for uh, put in jeopardy for that period of time. So um, when the events happened, um, we made the decision just incredibly quickly to evacuate that building. And I credit a lot of that to Rick. You know, I really truly believe um, just in the short period of time that I worked with him and, and the training that he gave us that um, he 
played a big role in not only saving my life, but, but so many other people. Now you mentioned there's 3,300 people in different uh, buildings in the World Trade Center complex. Uh, so in the building you were in, um, where were most of them concentrated? What floors of the building, or was it all over the place? So I, my responsibility and where I worked, um, I worked with a great group of people on the 61st floor of Tower Two, uh, and that particular day we um, we we were on the second day of a three-week training program where we had, of course, ironically, the largest training class we've ever had uh, of 276 people that really came in from all across the country. Um, and these folks were here on their second day of their first week of a three-week training program in New York City. And as a native New Yorker, I can tell you um, wholeheartedly, you know, New York is, it's the greatest place in the world. But you know what, if you're not accustomed to it, it can be a pretty intimidating place. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, these people were just trying to get used to, okay, and accommodated to being in New York City, which, you know, for a lot of them was just an overwhelming experience to begin with. And um, certainly, and of course, no one would have ever anticipated what, what, was, what was to kind of happen moving forward. And, um, and that was, you know, something that just came and, and um, you know, was quite unexpected. How did you learn about the first plane hitting Tower One, and what was the reaction? Well, what I remember from that night or day, I should say, is, you know, walking in and, and going to my job and being there at 7 a.m., and getting things prepared. And fortunately, the first speaker that we had that day actually showed up 15 minutes early, which you don't think about certain things until they matter. And, and I, I thought that was fantastic, getting him on early, having him speak, and kind of getting the class ready and, and, and um, have everybody be attentive for that time. And when he finished speaking, he finished speaking about 15 minutes early. And ironically, he never realized how important that time would be because what I did is um, put everybody on break, okay, for an extended period of time and told them, hey, you can go and, you know, go downstairs and relax, go to the cafeteria, get yourself a coffee, and you got a half hour now instead of 15 minutes on a break, which is great. Um, but literally, maybe about five or, or 10 minutes after he had finished speaking, someone came running up to me and they said, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some structural damage in, in one of the offices. And I said, what do you mean? And I actually walked back there and I saw a crack in the glass of one of the rooms that we used um, uh, to, to house all the people that we had. And I knew something was wrong because it just didn't seem right. And I remember looking out the window and, you know, as a big New York Yankee fan, I remember when the Yankees beat the Mets in 2000, we had a ticker tape parade down there and it was great. And there was all these wonderful things flying outside because people were celebrating. This was kind of like a more horrific version of that. There was debris, there was things that were on fire, and there were, there were just, you knew something was wrong. So my first instinct was go back into the center room, okay, try to get my hands around all of the folks that were still up there, try to organize it and wait for instruction. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, after the second plane hit Tower Two, they were still telling, the building management was still telling people not to leave the building, right? Well, I remember this vividly. Um, we decided because of security and, and the folks kind of instructing us and saying, might not be a bad idea to leave the building. I remember making the decision because it was my class that let's, let's leave. You know, um, I, I just thought it was a prudent decision. I thought it was the right thing to do. And we can always come back into the building but again, after all the stories and, and all the education that Rick gave us and, and, and the team put in our heads, you know, you can't always leave the building. You know, it, it can take time to get downstairs. And I certainly don't want to see anybody jeopardized uh, or any lives put in danger. So um, we actually evacuated, went down the stairwell and got to about the 50th floor. And the 50th floor was a re-entry floor. And right before we got to the 50th floor, it actually had come across the intercom uh, system that you know, building one was hit by an aircraft, building two is secure, uh, go back to your desks. And I remember I had a small group of people with me and they actually said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, oh, well, uh, I'm just thinking we should just leave because you know what? I, I mean, I don't know what's going on in the other building. And if there's a fire, um, you know, smoke can certainly be uh, dangerous. 
and uh, not something that, that, that we want to encounter. And let's just go downstairs and we'll regroup and, and we'll figure it out. And I would say literally within two or three minutes of that decision, um, well, th then we got hit. And what floor did the plane hit in your building? To this day, I, I don't know exactly where it was, but um, yeah, it, it was above us. I, I, I think it was somewhere in the, in, probably in the low 90s or high 80s. And all I can tell you is we felt the impact of the building. You know, if you worked in the World Trade Center, that building was so tall and it was such an incredible structure that it would actually sway with the wind. So, you know, sometimes you'd be in there and you'd actually feel like you were moving in the building, which was great. It was just such a structural marvel and it was just an incredible place to be. But um, when we got impacted by the plane, it literally felt like, like we were on a pendulum just swinging back and forth and, and actually, you know, could, could, I, I felt like I was gonna fall out of the building. And what amazed me was just how incredibly well composed the folks were um, as we evacuated the building. And all I could think about that day was, um, you know, I usually talk to my mom early in the morning, uh, all times before I went to work, she'd always call me. And uh, that particular day, I was just so busy, I didn't get a chance to do it. And I, I was just, just kind of, kind of regretful I didn't have a conversation with her because I didn't know if I was gonna get out of there or not. But all I could tell you um, is that folks were just incredible and, and amazingly focused and just um, everybody was pitching in to help everybody else just just get out of the building. Were you in contact with Rick at any point during the morning? No, I mean, you know, just the security team that, that Rick was in charge of and entrusted to. And I remember coming down when we, when we finally got down the stairwell, there was the uh, observatory deck, which I believe was on the eighth floor. And I was actually with a senior member of management from Morgan Stanley who was helping me um, uh, get some of the, the folks moved downstairs. And I can remember as we went down the escalator from the eighth floor, I could hear Rick because Rick had a voice you never forget, you know, with his accent and just his authoritative demeanor, which was, again, as a soldier, as, as somebody to respect as a leader, you certainly make note of when you hear it. And um, I could hear him instructing us, you know, to come down and, and to exit the building. And I didn't actually see him run up the stairs, but I heard the stories of him coaching and helping and singing and doing anything he could to help people feel better for, for, the, for the chaos that was ensuing us and trying to relieve and soothe us, but also trying to do what Rick did best, which was protect and, and get people out of the building. You mentioned that folks had said it took two hours to get downstairs back in the 93 bombing. How long did it take you and the folks you were responsible for to get down there that day? Amazingly fast. I never walked down 61 flights of stairs faster. And actually at one point, I was carrying a couple of people with me that were having a hard time getting down 61 flights of stairs. The old story I like to tell is, you know, I was probably about 30 pounds lighter back then <laughs> and uh, probably in the shape of my life. And, and, and it actually was helpful because um, it allowed me to help some other folks that, that maybe weren't quite uh, as physically adept in, in walking down 61 flights of stairs to get down there. And um, I'd say we got down the stairwell and out of the building in probably less than 12 minutes. 12 minutes. So then did you find the people you had sent downstairs earlier? Did you reconvene with them somewhere outside or inside or well i mean when everybody we went, just kind of scattered at that point well when we were outside i remember i had a group of people with me and, and someone else from morgan stanley senior management and quite frankly we didn't know what to do and, and what was going on but i remember going up to a police officer that was there and i said you know i've, I've got some folks i'm responsible for what do i do and he said honestly he goes get out of downtown he goes, because we heard there's another plane coming. And at that point I said, all right, um, you know what? We, we would house all the folks that would come in for this three week training program um, in three different locations. There was a wonderful hotel called the South Gate right across the Madison Square Garden. Uh, the East Gate, which was located right near there and the Hotel Surrey. So I just basically said to, to the folks I was with, just go back to the South Gate. I'll get my way up there eventually. And, and you know we'll, we'll begin to try to piece this together. And um, I remember making that walk from downtown Manhattan uh, to, to the Southgate Hotel. And I was desperately trying to call my mom and my dad because um, 
you know, my dad, who's a former World War II veteran and uh, unfortunately was incapacitated back then in a wheelchair. Um, you know, my parents were elderly and I just wanted to make sure that they knew that I was okay. But there was just no cell phone service at all. And um, I think I found a one pain phone where there wasn't a line of 20 people on. And uh, I was able to call my parents and let them know. And they asked me, they really requested that I come home, just walk back to Yonkers. It was a little bit of a long walk. <laughs> uh, but I said, look, I said, I've got responsibility here. I said, I've got people that, that I'm responsible for that are gonna need my help. And I, I don't know, quite frankly, what I can do for them, but, but just to have somebody there that can help them, um, I thought would be the right thing to do. So what did you do with them? Well, I went and walked back to, to the uh, Southgate Hotel. And, you know, all I can tell you is the people and the staff at the Southgate Hotel were so amazing in helping me. I identified myself. I told, I told them who I was. And I said, I have no lists. I have nothing that's going to be able to be a roster for, for accountability for the folks that we had. And they set me up in the back of the hotel and, and really in my own command center and provided me every resource I needed to try to piece this together uh, and, and try to see out of the 276 people we had, um, who, who we had and, and who was in the hotel and how we can find people that weren't and, and really just account for everybody. And it was a long, long process. And, um, you know, we actually figured out a system where we had the other two hotels fax in the registry for people that had checked in and I had actually spoken to the people that, that, that checked in, went out to the streets of Manhattan at one point, walked around, and it was amazing after only a day and a half, how many people I recognized from the class. And I think a lot of folks were in shock, as you can imagine, and just trying to get them back into the hotel and try to help them and, and make sure that their well-being was taken care of. Where were you when the tower came down? This was when I was walking um, from downtown New York. And interestingly enough, I had walked east and I think I was somewhere probably around Canal Street or, or um, I remember being near J&R Music World, which was a gay place that I knew very well uh, in the electronics store. And I just felt this rumble and it was like nothing else I ever felt. I thought it was an earthquake. And I remember running under an awning and looking and just seeing what looked like a house of cards just come down and see this giant billowing um, smoke coming out. And I remember at that point, I thought to myself, I, I can't believe what I just saw. And the folks and the people that were in there were the only thing at the forefront of my mind. And it was devastating. Did you head back to the hotel then? What did you, how did you respond in terms of making decisions after that? I just decided to go back to the hotel and do everything I could. Whatever help I could provide and whatever I could do to help, that's what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, look, I always think about 9-11 and I always, I always say, you saw the best in people and the worst in people on the same day, which is something that uh, you don't frequently see. But I can't really look back on it with any positive memories, except for one thing. You know, people lost their families, they lost their husbands, their wives, children. It'll never be a positive experience for me. But the inspiration of seeing people bond and work together, the greatest thing I've ever seen. And people truly, wanted to help each other that day. And people truly wanted to work together. And together we all overcame something we never thought we'd have to experience, but we worked together through it. What are some examples of what you saw? People who perhaps didn't even really know each other because they were all coming together for this training session. How did they work together? You talked about how you were pretty much carrying two people down the stairs. Well, what I'll always remember when we were in the Southgate Hotel, uh, probably about an hour and a half after everything happened, someone had come up to me and said, you know, you probably should address or have a meeting with the people that are here. And again, by no means was I an expert in dealing with uh, 
situations such as this. So I was kind of piecing it together myself. But they said they need to hear from somebody in leadership or management here some type of reassurance that there's going to be support and help for them and um, really addressing them on, on what's going on. So I had a meeting and I remember saying to myself, you know, a lot of folks left their, um, a, a lot of the ladies left their pocketbooks and gentlemen left their, their jackets with their wallets in it. And there were people that needed money and they needed some help and support. So I actually passed the cardboard box around the meeting room and I said, you know, look, we'll, we'll get this straightened out and the firm will come in and support us. Uh, I know that for a fact because it's just a great place to be. I said, but in the interim, people need food and, you know, um, just need some help. And I passed around a cardboard box and I would say within less than five minutes, I had $3,600 in there. And I remember looking at that saying to myself, that reaffirms my, my faith in humanity. Because again, as I stated, people cared more about other folks than they cared about themselves. And they wanted to help and donate in any way they can. I remember having a meeting and again, not knowing what to say, but all I did was say that I'm gonna give you the best effort I have to work this through. And um, I know this great firm that we work for will certainly support us and help us. And I'm gonna get you home and back to your families. I don't know how yet, but I'm going to. Just just give it some time, and have some faith. And that got a little complicated since they grounded all the flights. Well, it certainly wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, w what I remember vividly was we, we had actually begun to get a, a little bit of a sense of normalcy um, within the first, let's say, day or so. And you know, for me, I just wanted to, to make people feel good. So I, I remember taking them to, to, we had a restaurant, lounge, bar uh, in, in, the, in the Southgate Hotel where I just told everybody to come and, and just meet. And we had a whole huge group of people and it was great. And I really felt like, you know what, we're, we're getting people in a better place. This has been an incredibly traumatizing event, but we're getting people in a better place. And, you know, lo and behold, we had the bomb scare at the um, Empire State Building. And that was kind of difficult because um, after that, you know, parents were driving up from all over the country to come and pick their children up. They just did not want to wait um, for us to get them back. And um, we, I, I actually really felt that, oh boy, you know, we, we, I think we kind of had it under control, but it went a little chaotic after that event. Now you mentioned as you were exiting Tower 2, you could hear Rick uh, Rascorla encouraging folks, singing to them. Um, and obviously you cleared the tower by a number of minutes before it came down. Um, why didn't Rick ultimately get out in time? I understand he went back up. What do you know about the sequence of events there? You know, I read about Rick um, after everything happened. And what's so inspiring about him was not only his actions that day, but his actions prior to that day um, in Vietnam. And Rick had always been asked, did you ever see the movie We Were Soldiers? And did you ever just see? And at least from what I read, I don't think he did. And Rick, Rick's opinion was always, you know what? The heroes aren't the folks that are still here. The heroes are the folks that are, that are no longer here. And again, just in my interactions with him, that's exactly how he came off, which to me meant he would rather sacrifice himself to save, save someone um, rather than, than provide for his own security. And you just knew he was going to get people out of that building, as many as he could. And his own safety and his own thought of, of himself, um, it was, it was not the number one priority for him. How did your company respond? You mentioned you knew that they would take care of the people who had left their wallets and so forth, but their offices were gone for thousands of people. So how did the company recover from that? After 24 years of working for this firm, it's not even, 
it's not even a, a company I work for, it's part of my life. And what they did to help people and to, to make this um, unbelievable, horrible event, even somewhat palatable to people, was extraordinary to me. You know, Morgan Stanley actually set up business contingency areas for folks to work out of. And Morgan Stanley helped and, and provided counseling and services to people that were affected by, by what we saw. And Morgan Stanley never forgets the events of that day. And, you know, look, with all the folks we had, we still had 12 people that didn't make it out of that building that, that were part of our family. And every year we honor them. And every year we talk about Rick. And every year we provide whatever support we need for people um, to help them. Because 18 years later, I can only tell you, um, it's a part of my life, it'll be a part of my life, and it'll be something that will always be in my memory. And I'm grateful for the firm I work with because of what they did from a support standpoint, the help they gave people, the continued support that they give them. Um, I think it speaks volumes about this firm. You mentioned 12 people didn't make it out, Rick being one of them. Um, if Rick hadn't worked for you, hadn't been there, hadn't been helping people out, it's, obvious, it's impossible to know how many more would have lost their lives. But the fact that out of 3,300, uh, the toll wasn't higher, how much credit does Rick deserve for that? and an unbelievably enormous amount of credit. Again, for someone that only worked in the building for a year, um, I really felt that I was trained to make the right decision. And I give 100% of the credit to Rick and, and his team. And to me, I, I can't even fathom how many lives could have been lost bad enough the lives that we did lose, but I can't even fathom the lives we could have lost if we didn't have someone like him, who not only was a hero, but a leader and an incredible one. Like you said, we're talking here in 2019. It's been 18 years, and obviously the first few anniversaries of 9-11 got wall to wall media coverage and attention and unless it's a 10 or a 15 it doesn't seem to get as much now I assume that's not the case with you and, and Morgan Stanley so when that day comes around and it seems like it's almost inevitable that it's a, a crisp day with not a cloud in the sky just like it was that day what do you what goes through your mind first think about 9 10 and being with my family and being with my friends and going to a Yankee Red Sox game that never happened because it got rained out. And then hanging out with my friends, watching the giant Bronco game the night before, getting home um, early in the evening, getting ready for the next day, couldn't wait. And just so excited about my job and what I did with folks. And I remember walking across the street because I lived in Battery Park City at that time. And it was a beautiful day. It, it, was, it was a perfect day. And I remember thinking like, man, this could be a good day. We're gonna get so many things done. It's gonna be just great. And, uh, you know, obviously we didn't know what was gonna happen. But, you know, the, the memories, um, the folks that didn't get out of the building, the lives that were irreparably changed, um, they, they're always gonna be part of it. But, the inspiration that I found that day, seeing people work together and uniting is really what I try to put at the, the forefront of my mind for, for that day. Evil didn't win that day, good did. And it came at a very, very, very costly price. But 
it um it prevailed. Last question. You said earlier that you live in Florida now. We're talking here in Washington. And the reason you're here is because Rick Rescorla is being honored uh, this week at the American Veterans Center Conference. What does it mean to you that he is being honored and that you are part of the opportunity to honor him? I couldn't be more honored to be with the people I'm going to be with. Um, you know, as the proud son of a World War II veteran, um, as the proud nephew of an uncle who I never met, who also um, unfortunately died in World War II, um, there's an American Legion post named after him. To have a whole family that was so focused and centered um, in the military, nothing to me is of greater value than to be surrounded by the people that I really feel are the true heroes. Um, and someone like Rick, to me, is a hero with no limitations for how you think of him. Uh, for what he did, the lives he saved, and everything that he accomplished. To be associated in any way, shape, or form, to keep his memory alive, and to see him get the uh, recognition that he deserves, to me is, it's priceless. And if I could have a conversation with him today, I would just say thank you, because I've got a great family, great kids, and um, I couldn't be happier in my life. And I think he had a big part in helping to make sure that I experienced that. And for him, it came at the ultimate cost. I can't make that up to him, but I certainly would love to, to see him honored and have his memory be, um, be in the front of everybody's mind. Well, that will happen this week. And uh, uh, Billy, I know that you've been very humble in talking about how the other people worked well together and the heroism of Rick that day. But I'm pretty sure those 276 people are really grateful for your leadership that day as well. And so thank you for that. And thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Bill Van Skyak is with Morgan Stanley and as was a former colleague of Rick Rescorla, who is being honored at the 2019 American Veterans Center Conference. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.